campus of Stanford University. People are worried about data. They're worried about their privacy and their security. They should be. We need secure systems. This is the future of everything. But we can't have a system that closes that data off. It is too rich of a source of inspiration, innovation, and discovery for new things in medicine. With your host, Russ Altman. Today on The Future of Everything, the future of sex and gender in research. Now, sex and gender in the past have often been used interchangeably, uh, but now they are starting to become distinct ideas with distinct connotations and denotations. So sex is a biological trait for an individual that determines their anatomy, their reproductive system, and the other features we associate with either being male or female, anatomically, genetically, biologically. Gender, on the other hand, refers to cultural concept of the roles that males, females, and others play in society, the concept of themselves and others, and is therefore a much more complicated and fluid idea and important. But what does this have to do with research? Well, there's increasing evidence that diverse teams, and I mean diverse in many axes, have better outcomes in research uh, and in the industrial setting for that matter. So what do I mean by outcomes? Better research, better discoveries, more general discoveries, um, and more useful discoveries for solving the problems in society. Better products, better services from diverse teams. And in diver diversity, of course, includes many considerations. Ethnicity, socioeconomic background, geographic origin, where you came from, uh, and sex and gender. Now, understanding how to build effective teams, therefore, is a high priority for anybody who's trying to get anything done with a group of people. And the successful projects will know how to use these factors, consider them, uh, take advantage of their knowledge and put together teams that are optimal or as, as good as they can be. Professor Londa Schiebinger is a professor of history of science at Stanford University, and she studies the role of sex and gender in science. This includes women's participation in science, the structure of scientific institutions, and the way knowledge is communicated about science. Londa, I think many people would understand the importance of women participating in science as a basic matter of fairness, access, opportunity, um, and equity. But your work suggests that other things like scientific institutions and even the way we discuss science has important connections to gender. And some people may find that less obvious. So where does that come from? It, as you say, it's important for women of all diverse ethnic backgrounds uh, to be involved in research. It's the right thing to do. It's a principle of social justice. Yes. But we find that diverse people also bring their social experience. They tend to see things that other people might not see. So that's very important. But in my work, I also have developed tools for understanding how sex and gender operates in the design of research. It's not enough to expect the women in the room to always bring forward the innovative moment for some um, medical technique or yes. some research project. Yes. What we need to do is teach everyone here at Stanford, the undergraduates, the graduate students, we need to teach everyone these ways of thinking. And so um, I've worked all around the world. I work a lot with the European Commission, the National Science Foundation, NIH here in the US. We have a research group in South Korea. I'm just now opening up South America, going to Brazil and Argentina. Um, and I'm struck by every one of these is a very different <laughs> culture. Yes, precisely. And what we want to do is make research work for everyone in these cultures, if you are constantly leaving out sex and or gender considerations, some design, like, like let's take my Tesla, for instance. <laughs> let's take it. I'll take it. <laughs> my Tesla. I was so excited to buy a Tesla because yes. one of my personal goals is to save the planet, right? right? That so okay. seems pretty green. So I get into my Tesla with great anticipation. It goes from zero to 60. It does all those wonderful <laughs> things. But then I had the sun in my eyes, the you know California afternoon sun yep. in my eyes, and I tried to swing my visor over. And because I am only five foot five, I guess, I always consider myself a very tall person, <laughs> um, 
the the seat wasn't designed for me oh. for erect posture at five foot five. Yes. So somehow, I guess Tesla stuffed one of their male engineers in the driver's seat and said, "Great, looks perfect." So they missed a demographic, and if they missed me, so. Car designers would these days design from the 5th percentile by height and weight to the 95th percentile so that they capture at least 90% of the population. And if Tesla missed me, they also missed many, many Asians. Mm -hmm. When I go to Japan, I'm really kind of a tall person. So the thing is, we need to make sure from the very beginning, what Tesla needed to do was consider... In this case, it's a physical characteristic. It's sex analysis. How do we make sure that our entire car is safe uh, for people of different heights and weights? Yes. And, and, and then you can, of course, extend that analogy to sex and gender. Uh, yes. And, and, you, and I want to get to your methods. You, you said you had these methods that can kind right. of be used to systematically look at a situation and figure out where the opportunities are. Before we go there, I just want to go back to this idea. Is it the case that the way our scientific institutions have been set up from their very founding and the way we communicate about science, because of the historical, uh, I don't know, predominance of men in those activities, do we need to even think about how those institutions are set up and how they communicate? Um, Or are we okay there? Or are there important sex and gender signals in those um, structures that we really need to uh, expose and think about? Well, I'm a historian, so now you're in trouble because Uh I can talk about that for two years. God forbid I (laughs) asked you something that you know about. (laughs) So the thing is that women were ready and willing to take their place in science in 1700. But when... When modern science was developed and all of science moved into universities, those institutions were closed to women. So you're quite right to say that those institutions have been designed around men's lives. And we also have the idea that the professor is somehow an individual and doesn't have a private life to balance or doesn't have a partner, which might also be important to productive work that they live in the same place. So I'm hearing that the institution really does reflect men in the 18th century. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Take your choice, Carl Linnaeus. Wow. (laughs) You know, take your choice. Um, So we really do have to fix the institutions. I have three fixes. One is fix the number of women, fix the institutions, and fix the knowledge. And these three are interrelated. Yes. You're not going to fix the institutions if you don't fix the knowledge. But if you don't have institutions which um, consider uh, the needs of women yes. as well as the needs of men so that everyone's careers can flourish, you're not going – Stanford still has a problem of attracting women yes. to engineering and many of the STEM fields. This is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Londa Schiebinger about sex, gender, women in science. And um, what about the second part of that? Is the way we communicate science – and I've I got to be honest, I haven't thought about this. Is it inherently filled with gender and sex biases that I might not be aware of, even even though I think I care about those issues? Yeah. So um, so it's how we design the research. If we think about sex and gender and ethnicity and any other variable that is important and include that in the design of research, we will have a much better outcome. Let's take AI, for example. Good. You get something like Google search returns ads for high-paying jobs five times more often to men than to women. Hmm. There's a gender bias. It's an unconscious bias. Google did not set it up to do that. Why did the machine learn to do these to returns. propose high-paying jobs to, For men, to, so that's about 200 It doesn't actually 000. even know who men and women are, uh, well, perhaps. The, Google knows who you are ah. because they collect all the and information. And they trade data. About, okay, fair enough. They so do know. You, they do you know. can identify. And their, <clears throat> their goal, of course, is to get you the right ad. Right. That's their business model. But um, so why did the machine decide that men should get this ad and women shouldn't get this ad, it's because of the pay gap, the gender pay gap in society. It doesn't take a genius, whether it's natural intelligence or artificial <laughs> intelligence, to realize that women are only paid about 80% as you know as a group right. uh, compared to men. And so if you are a rational 
person or program or an algorithm, yeah. you're going to say, okay, this is the person who would be interested in that in that mm. job. So. The good thing about all of this now is we are becoming aware of it, and we have various fixes. So if you're doing an AI program, you can check your data first. You can – there are two uh, two groups working on this. One has proposed data sheets for data sets. So it's kind of like setting up a clinical trial. You want to know, okay, who's in this data? Is it representative of everyone? Yes. Um, you know, so is the data fair? Then we might get – an algorithm that spits out a fair result. Yes. Um, and then if you can't control the data, um, I can give you another example about natural language processing. If you can't control the data, then you can often debias the algorithm. Yes. Um, and there are two interesting techniques for that, counterfactuals and multi-accuracy audits. Many so these techniques. are technical ways to try to build into the algorithm uh, a, a resistance to um, – to introducing bias that might be present in the data into its answers or its predictions. Exactly. So and that's very uh, so that's very I, exciting that you can do this technically yes. by kind of training the algorithm how to not be. Bi- it's kind of like what we try to do with our children when we try to train <laughs> them to be open minded and fair minded. You want the same principles in your machine learning algorithms. Precisely. And I have a great collaborator who's a computer scientist, and he often comes and talks to my classes, and he'll talk about this debiasing of the algorithms, and he'll say, you know. I can debias algorithms, but I can't debias society. So we human beings haven't done our job. So what are – you've made a reference to these 12 methods that you have. Um, to what, what are they, first of all, in, in general? And then can you give us some examples of how they might be useful tools to people who are trying to do good research and, and don't know where to start? Right, precisely. So they're, they're kind of general, and then we have – as you say, examples okay. to illustrate them. So analyzing sex, for example, what does that include? We have like five easy steps. <laughs> you don't want to huh. you don't want to overemphasize sex, which is done sometimes in neuroscience. Uh, you don't want to ignore sex. So let's take, for instance, the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S. They have found that analyzing sex is so important that a policy was introduced in 2016 that anyone receiving public funding U.S. taxpayer dollars must include sex analysis because we know, for instance, that drugs metabolize differently in yes. women as a group than in men. And it's dangerous if we don't, in fact, collect the data for research correctly by having enough men and yeah, women. Yeah, we can be putting women in danger by giving them drugs. That... Exactly. In fact, I, I happen to know that for many years they would not use female – I'm sure you know this as well <laughs> – they would not use female mice in experiments because that their, their, um, their menstrual periods, they said, messed up the data. Well, guess what? All of my patients who are less than you know 40 years old and, and, not, and not postmenopausal – are having menstrual cycles, and if I don't know the effect of a drug on on that biology, I could be making grave mistakes. And so th- this was until re- very recently. Yes. You just didn't do experiments on female mice, which blew my mind. I, I do I don't do that kind of work, and so I was very surprised. Yeah. Because they don't tell you that on the drug label when you're giving these drugs to to women. Exactly. Of reproductive age. Right. So the female mice have the pesky hormones. So this is the problem. <laughs> They're just like the male mice, but they have pesky hormones. So NIH. For many, many years, in 1993, there was a law that women had to be included in clinical trials. But as you say, the preclinical research was done on all right. male the, the cells. Kind of the cows out of the barn by then. Cells and tissues and male mice. This is not responsible science to suddenly release a drug on real life it's unethical, human actually. women. It's unethical. Exactly. But this... the scientists want to say it's too expensive. Well, it's not because developing a drug can be as much as $5 billion. Yes. So if you get it right at the very beginning, our whole project, Gendered Innovations, is an attempt to get the science right from the very beginning and don't go through the withdrawal of the drugs from which the market. Which is the real expensive Which is the real disaster. expensive thing. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. And I'm speaking with Londa Schiebinger about sex and gender in basic science research. So, yes. So, now, you have 12 of these areas. Mm-hmm. Um, who is your consumer? Like, who do you market these? Uh, it's, so we just discussed one of them, which is how to consider sex and gender in, in mm-hmm. the design of your research. Um, 
is it sticking? Do people get it? Or is it an uphill battle to get people to th change the way they're thinking about their scientific study design? Right. So our audience is researchers, people like you, um, Stanford professors, professors all over the world, uh, Google research, any of these people. And, you know, it, so I'm, I've been in the business for a long time, and it really is beginning to stick. One thing that is making it stick is that funding agencies are now requiring that sex and gender analysis be right. included in your proposal or you don't get the public right. funding. So there's always sticks and carrots, and that's, that's kind exactly. of like a stick. Exactly. And then at the other end of research for publication, peer-reviewed journals are also asking that these manuscripts be excellent, i.e., if you need to have sex analysis, have you collected the data and analyzed it correctly? So you have looked at uh, th th these biases. Um, you talk about bias in AI. Um, uh, you, you made a, a, an earlier comment, and I want to get back to it because I think it's fascinating. You said that um, there's evidence that um, women and, and, and non uh, you know northern European men have had interest and contributions to science throughout history, and that it was with the creation of institutions in the 18th century that some of them were kind of systematically blocked. And I know that you've looked at um, actual scientific discovery among before the, the kind of current system gelled. And, and you have a series of a kind of amazing stories of women, even slaves, um, making scientific discoveries. And, and I can now see how that feeds into some of this. So can you tell us about that? Well, uh, where did it come from? Where, where did what come the from? The idea to look and then oh. what you found. Well, uh, oh, for me? Yes. Oh, um, well, I started out at Harvard as a graduate student when there was no study of sex and gender whatsoever. And I realized that there was a lot of lived experience in women's world that was not represented in history, which was the subject I was getting my PhD in. <laughs> so I went after huh. some of this experience. And probably my most amazing, well, I have many amazing stories, but one of the most amazing stories uh, is in a book uh, called Plants and Empire. Yes. And I found that slave women knew all about abortifacients. These are herbs that um, induce abortion. And they used them because they did not want their children to become slaves like they were. So it's a big political wow. issue, and it is also a science issue. Yes. So they knew they had all this knowledge, um, and they used it secretly, and it was not shared with male physicians. Huh. It's a fabulous story. So they were experts on chemical ways. Yes. Uh, to to. Um manage unwanted pregnancies. Yes, herbal medicine, if and you will. And probably, now where were your, so we could go forever <laughs> yeah, on this, but we where were ahead. the sources of mm. information about this? Well, interest It certainly wasn't in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. No. So interestingly, there was one woman scientist who in the 18th century voyaged for her science. This is Maria Sibylla Marion. And she went from Amsterdam to the New World uh, to Suriname, she was looking specifically for a caterpillar that would spin a new silk so she could break the Chinese monopoly and become a wealthy woman. But in her book on entomology, on insects, she included this story on the slave women aborting their children and told me all about the flower and the seeds wow. and everything that was used and how it was made and why it was used. And I said, too much information for a book on insects. And so I wrote a book about this whole story. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Londa Schiebinger about sex, gender, and science next on Sirius XM Insight 121. From the campus of Stanford University. People are worried about data. They're worried about their privacy and their security. They should be. We need secure systems. This is the future of everything. But we can't have a system that closes that data off. It is too rich of a source of inspiration, innovation, and discovery for new things in medicine. With your host, Russ Altman. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Londa Schiebinger about sex, gender, and now robots. <laughs> so um, one of the things you've written about and thought about is uh, should robots have a gender? And so when I first saw that, it was like, oh, my goodness, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Tell me where that question even comes from. Is, is that a relevant question today or is that just for fun? 
This is a really relevant question. The robots are surely coming, and the question is, should they be gendered? Siri, for example, on my phone has a different gender than Siri on my wife's phone. Yes, <laughs> you can choose the voice now, but Apple started. So the virtual assistants are really interesting because Apple started with a female assistant. This is a knee-jerk reaction. Huh. Females who are ever available, mm. subordinate, fulfilling your ever need. Does this sound like a stereotype you're familiar a bit with? It does. <clears throat> the problem oh my so the thing is that right now, robots and these virtual assistants are being gendered without any thought about it. It's more like a knee-jerk reaction to a stereotype. We ha if we do that, if we build our current human stereotypes into robots, into hardware, we will relive the 1950s indefinitely. We will lose many of the great advances we've made in gender equality. Um, and so... My challenge to roboticists is to simply consider what kind of gender do you want this in a robot? Now, let's say it's a nursing robot. <clears throat> Elderly people need a lot of care, and there won't be enough young people around to take care of them. So we might have robots that help bathe people. Now, here's where I think gender could mm -hmm. be an important thing. Uh, we don't know if gendering a robot to human <clears throat> <clears throat> to meet human expectations will encourage compliance on the part of the humans. Will they say so a nursing robot hum, because 90% of human nurses are women, right. they would expect a female robot. Will they take their medicines better? Will they do the exercise if this is what the robot is telling them to do? Will they feel more comfortable? Well, this being really bathed? does make sense. You could imagine big differences in success <coughs> rates in delivering medications, taking showers based on the uh, perceived gender of the automated assistant. And it could even be a personal decision. So it might be that some people would do better uh, with a certain gendered robot and others would do uh, – and it might not go strictly along uh, sex and gender lines. Exactly. So my challenge to roboticists is to consider gender. And I have six challenges. You know, you should consider gender. Oh, good. Let's, I, people love lists. Let's, let's go <laughs> well, through Well, you know, I say that and then I'm not going to remember okay. all of them. Let's get but at least one, four or five of them. One is to – Try counteracting gender stereotypes. What if we surprised people? What if we made robots that did not meet our human expectations? That would loosen up gender roles in human society. Because for technology, you get this vicious circle, which I want to create into a virtuous circle. Yes. So I want technologists to consider how they're gendering robots. This will um, influence the user to think about gender roles and norms. Yes, yes. This eventually comes back to change gender norms in society. So perhaps we can use robots in really interesting ways. What an amazing idea. Yes. So that <clears throat> our interaction with robots changes our interaction with one another and hopefully in a better way. Okay, so that was a good one. Can you give me a couple more of these principles for the robotics? Right, so another principle would be to um, keep robots in robot space and not gender them at all. Can we give them a robot identity? So that right. there's one... Uh, and is that even possible? Because humans are so... Is that even so, possible? We're so, it seems like we're biologically programmed to project gender onto other people, whether or not they want it. And I, it, it's interesting to know if biologically you can get humans to say that is not a gendered object, even though I'm talking to it. It's not a biological aspect that we yeah. gender everything. In the eight, To come back to the 18th century, um, we our whole democratic society. In the 18th century, we had uh, the American Revolution, got rid of monarchs, and put the power with the individual to vote. But women and uh, African-American men, anybody who was not a white male property owner, was not given the vote. So gender is a very deep yeah. power structure in our society, and this is why we gender everything. Right. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Professor Londa Schiebinger about uh, our robots and their genders. Okay, so um, we might want to consider the possibility of a 
neutral, non-gendered robot and what that would do. Um, actually, that's in very big contradistinction to what you were just saying yes. about the opportunities for maybe having it be a useful, virtuous use of gendering. Okay, can, can I ask you, these are great, so can I ask you for a couple of more robotic gender principles? Well, one thing we don't have at all is anything that promotes gender fluidity. So a lot of people don't want to fit yes. into gender roles. They want to slip and slide between gender roles. But once you create a robot, it's kind of stuck because it's hardware. So I don't even know what that would mean to have a gender fluid robot. And we couldn't obviously mm. couldn't find any examples. But that's my challenge to the designers. What would that mean? It is really fascinating because... You're right. I mean, yes, they are physical and they're hardwired, but they also have software which can change. And so you could imagine sometimes your robot is speaking to you in a kind of traditional women gender way. And then other times it just flips over. And, 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 and what would that mean? Would it cause nothing but confusion? Yeah. Or would it also have these virtual virtuous effects. Yeah. So I think what this all prompts is for humans to think about how we gender things and why we gender things. And can we as humans move to a more equal society where gender does not embed power? And can robots be a part of this equation? So how open, <laughs> you, you live this every day, how open are the technologists, um, for example, right now you and I are sitting in the middle of Silicon Valley. There are a lot of technologists trying to develop a lot of technologies. How open are they to these principles or do they say, you know, please give us a break. We're just trying to get the thing to work and we can't really think about a complex gender strategy for our, for our robot. Or are, are you finding people much more open to this? I'm finding people much more open. Last a week, a year ago in January, I had a workshop on robotics and gender. And, you know, some of my colleagues came and said, oh, I started thinking about this at nine o'clock this morning. But nonetheless, they were open and willing to talk about it. And now through the HAI, I have a seed grant proposal in with one of these colleagues who wants to HAI think. is the Human yeah, Centered AI Institute, which is a new Here uh, at Stanford. A new activity at Stanford. Right. Yes. So now we have uh, an, uh, an engineer working with a humanist, me, and we want to apply the questions about gender to self-driving cars. Wow. This is the this is the outcome. I find once so this kind of information is not in the engineering curriculum. Absolutely not. That I can should, attest to. It should be in the core courses so people get a little bit of the flavor. Stanford is not doing a service to Google by graduating engineers who don't understand social issues. So that's one of the things we can do, very concrete proposal. But I find like through this workshop, the people who came, they were they were happy to come, the robotists and then we bring along the humanists and social scientists. They were happy to come. They were happy to think about it. I had also a workshop on uh, machine learning. And I try to keep the workshops at about 13, 15 people so we can really talk. But this one grew. People wanted it more and more and more. So it was about 25 people, people from industry, people from Stanford. And, um, you know, it was really great. So it's wonderful to hear that these technologies – Technologists are open to this, they're engaging, and we have some reason to be hopeful that the forthcoming technologies will be sensitive to these issues and not uh, harden existing biases, but perhaps even help us all uh, learn more about how to be um, more effective in building diverse uh, functioning teams. Yes. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.